Hi! Hello! Welcome, my dear Despise Girls! Oh my god, I'm so missing all of you. Like, two of you. It's really, like, been so long. And then everyone in the audience, because we haven't seen you for how many months again? Two months, no? Two months already. I missed you. I, I couldn't even recognize your faces. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> Amelia, seriously. <laughs> But it seems like we are in the same wavelength because all of us are wearing black tonight. Yeah. yeah. Show, show the audience your t-shirt, please. Yes. Oh. <laughs> My so official true. Despise Girls t-shirt. And then at the back, it says... Yeah. <laughs> I've been seeing you like your photos in the rally with that t-shirt. I'm so jealous, right? <laughs> we miss you, Rina. I know, I know, I know, I know. Yeah, but there will be a time when we all get to wear the, the shirt together at the same time. This should have been the opportunity and we didn't do it. <laughs> Oh well, a lot of things have happened no, in the two months that uh, we were uh, off the air, but certainly not uh, really, you know, out of consciousness because we've been doing so many things uh, in all of this time that uh, we failed to do uh, uh, an, an episode. So, uh, for instance. Yeah. Emilia and I got to see each other face to face last June. <laughs> what was that? Like the face to face is last June for the intersessional, right? UNF Triple C or G7? No, it was the intersessional in Bonn for climate change. Um, countries gathered to discuss the the technical documents that will be presented at the climate change COP in November in Egypt. So it was two weeks of very hard work. I was only one week because the previous week I, I was actually also in Brussels for the Eurodats conference, which was amazing. I also have to tell you all about it. And then I went to Bonn, and that's where I met Tete on the second mm -hmm. week. But Tete had been there for the two full weeks, right, Tete? Yes, I was in Bonn for the full two weeks. But like Emilia, I was also in Stockholm, Sweden oh, the sure. week before that <laughs> to be part of the Stockholm Plus 50 activities. No, uh, Don't ask me about it. I think it was just one huge waste of time. No, because money? it was not... We want to ask you about it. <laughs> oh my gosh. No, Stockholm Plus 50 was supposed to be a big moment. Now, commemorating the 50 years since the 1972 Stockholm Declaration on the Environment where governments committed this and committed that. So they met again in Stockholm um, to see, you know, uh, how the world is now 50 years since they made the commitment to uh, try and make it better. But like I said, I felt it was such a huge waste of time because you hear all of those nice sounding pronouncements again. There was even an, a declaration, but it only affirms what has already been said long ago, but no new promises, no, <laughs> no new commitments and no new actions. It was that the problem with summits, right? That they get together multi-stakeholder processes. They just have big declarations, waste of time. There's no binding commitment. And the most important thing, there's no negotiated document. So in the end, there is no actionable process. And Stockholm, what? They were calling us to meetings for two years, right? So it was a yep. huge waste of our time, a huge waste of money because they, were, they held also thematic meetings throughout the, the previous year. So it's such a disappointment. Yeah. And then, Although like, there was something good uh, from Stockholm that I bring with me, but it's sadly not in the official UN space. 
no? Because there were also some civil society and social movement actions and activities in Stockholm. And I think one of the more important ones was about this um, fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty mm. that um, civil society, academia, yeah. and some governments are also trying to... Um, uh, push forward no? a, a non-proliferation treaty on fossil fuels and I think it's gaining ground so that's one good thing I take away from uh, Stockholm but that was not in the official UN uh, yeah. not in no, the official that's, UN meeting. that's happening so, for a while that's mm, happening for a while so there was a meeting yeah. during that time you're saying for the the treaty right the discussion yes. with the society mm. I see Mm -hmm. You know, for, for Stockholm plus 50, I was actually, you know, what they are trying to do is not only the global level process. They also have the Asia Pacific regional process for that. And I was in the last region as well. Yeah. <laughs> and they also have I attended the, the Asia Pacific one. one. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And then also there's a national level one. Yeah. And then we attended, uh, for me, I attended the regional one with Asia Pacific. And then, uh, you know, my 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 friend Patricia from APWLD attended the national level consultation for Thailand, right? So it was just like, I don't know, just like what you said, Amelia, is like summit is more like what? Like a talk show, like a performance, mm -hmm. you know, like everything was like so orchestrated, you know, and then there's a moderator that, that looks very, you know, chic and then, you know, everything is just, it is, I think there's not meaningful, although in my session, I think there are some good uh, speakers, you know, that is actually talking about indigenous women's, uh, you know, and then the situation that they have. But the question is, where is it going, you know? And then in the national level, because uh, based from what I heard is that really like the one that got invited, mostly the private sector, you know, yeah. there's no really grassroots uh, local communities. If you want to do something on national level, then it's actually the value add, right? You can actually bring local communities and grassroots uh, uh, women, you know, and all that coming together, but apparently not, right? So it's, it's, it's a little bit sad. So. Please tell the audience what Stockholm plus 50 means because the three of us just launched. Oh, yeah. Criticizing and saying it's useless. But none of us no, I playing. actually started with a brief intro of what uh, the <laughs> Stockholm Plus 50 is. You know, like in 1972, there was this big UN meeting in Stockholm, Sweden to talk about environment and development. So that was a big meeting that led to some commitments from governments to take uh, the environment uh, considerations in their development actions. So fast forward 50 years later, I think uh, Stockholm Plus 50 was organized more out of nostalgia, no? <laughs> because even the even Swedish civil society, they were really critical about how their government uh, organized the meeting. And then they even said that, oh, because Sweden has lots of money, it can host uh, anything it can provide the space especially since people have not been coming to face-to-face -face meetings because of the pandemic so this would have been a good moment for networking so that's coming from swedish civil society you know the value of that big meeting where thousands of people came was really just for networking and saying hi i missed you <laughs> No, but it's, it's it's ridiculous. We don't need networking in the face of the environmental emergency, right? It's really so dire. We need real action and we need regulation for the private sector, for the fossil fuels companies. So it's a, it's a disappointment. Just wanted to tap on one of the things that Rina said, because in the Asia Pacific, there was no opening for, for local communities. In the LAC region, they invited... Um, religious organizations to be in the panels mm, and they said no this is why we need to have a political presence because we're promoting bills at the local uh, congresses to to plant trees and i was like no we are promoting secular states and you are entitled to do whatever political work on your citizens capacity but we will not allow churches to do to have a you know a political personality because we've seen what you have done with women's rights and community rights and indigenous people's rights so that's not happening 
And the other thing is that they invited the head of banks to be panelists and to guide the conversation so that the outcome would reflect what the bankers were saying. And of course, they were saying, oh, we need one more climate finance too. Climate finance should go through our banks so that we distribute it through loans, whatever. Oh, like, wow. <laughs> and, and that was the UN organizing and inviting the, these people as the main speakers for the LAC region so that the outcome, of course, would be biased towards those messages from the start. I was fuming. I was like, this is biased. We will not recognize this document, whatever. I was just, you know, being a feminist bulldozer. And <laughs> luckily, I had, of course, the support of the LAC uh, civil society because they're so progressive. So the program was more regressive and more in tune in alignment with the multi-stakeholders bullshit that the UN is selling. But the people really wanted to have a different conversation. And I think that's also what happened in the Asia meeting. So yeah. it's important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we we keep on hearing the same narrative, no, all in the different forums. Like, it's a commitment to net zero uh, emissions by 2050. It's a commitment for nature-based solutions. So all of these four solutions are being discussed in the many different uh, UN forums, no. And um, for those of you who may find you know this nature-based solutions net zero quite familiar it's true we discussed that already several it's episodes ago <laughs> yeah watch our video again what? several episodes ago we talked about this and just to prove to everyone that this is already the the mantra no whether yeah. it's at the uh uh, environment and development space, in the climate space, in the SDG space, all of these things are being consistently discussed. Yep. So let's leave Sweden. And now let's continue on with our journey. Emilia went to Brussels. Yes. So that sounds exciting. It was really exciting. Well, just to say, uh, hopefully we can put the link to our video on Fall Solutions, the first episode of the Rise Up series, so that people who may want to see it again and watching it again, please do so. And so I went to Brussels, uh, Euro that had its first meeting uh, in person of their members after so many years. And it was really important because we, I was invited as a responder for the keynote speaker who was Jason Hickel. And I'm a huge fan of Jason Hickel. Like, really, the guy is so brilliant. And then I got to reply. And I was really challenging the European and Northern Network saying, uh, you have let us down in the global south. I was just saying what everybody says after our meetings, you know, I wasn't just bringing something new is really to say, and it's not necessarily addressed to Eurodot, who are amazing, right? We, they're actually great allies to, to our movement, but more generally, like we need the Global North to organize and to really challenge power in their lane, right? The OECD, the G7, the G20, the EU parliament, everything, <clears throat> the, the Australian position, Japan, the US, we need them, you know, to be to be more bold, to be more, more radical, and uh, otherwise they're letting us down in the south because it doesn't matter how much they say, oh, the global south is gonna save us. No, we're, you know, we're being pinned to the floor because the huge powers that happen in the global north, and it's not only the concentration of wealth because that is an issue, but also the political leaders and uh, everybody from decision makers that are so opaque and so undemocratic, especially the EU, and nobody's questioning that internally, right? So when they get into negotiation, it's like, okay, the EU has a position. And I'm sorry, it cannot be changed. And it's like, yeah, well, you should have done your work, you know, before coming here. And it's not just one thing just related to one negotiation. It's about building capacity and advocacy internally. But they're so caught up with their cooperation agenda and giving aid and uh, ODA and, you know, charity. Uh, so it's really a mess. So that's what I was talking about. 
It was good. It was well received. Half of the people kept on quoting. Well, all of the people kept on quoting what I said, but half of them were saying, yes, but what Emilia said does not apply to me. So it's like, okay, <laughs> okay, but it, it does apply to you. Uh, but then, I don't know, but it was a, a good starting of my trip because it's important that, uh, that we say very openly, this is not just my personal position. People in the global south is really tired of stepping up, of putting the bodies, putting people going to jail. And we're expecting people in the global north to really step up, to re-strategize, especially in the face of the imminence of the environmental emergency. So many things are happening. <clears throat> we understand they're fighting fascism in their regimes, but so are we. So it's not about, oh, we have a shrinking space for participation. It's the same with us. So we need them to reorganize, to be bold, and they will have our support and they will have our solidarity, but we really need the Global North to step up. So that was actually the message of my entire trip. And I became persona non grata wherever I went, because of course I was in the Global North the entire time, but, but that's... Uh, you know, those are the costs of our um, environmentalist, activist, feminist, decolonial from the global south. It was tough. I'm telling you, it was tough. People just say, oh, you're so brave. It's like, no, we need you to be brave. We don't want to be brave. You know, we're tired. It's time that you, you know, start giving, giving the energy that you expect from us in the global south. So that was Brussels. And then we went to Berlin. No, Bonn. Yes, we went to Bonn for the uh, 56th uh, intercessional. No, it's a it's a in between COP session, so it's really a technical discussion about uh, you know what governments um, pledge to do uh, from Glasgow COP 26. So this is the follow up to that COP 26, and um there were a lot of it's been a busy two weeks in bond because there were a lot of sessions where the format was very confusing there were round table discussions there were um, breakout rooms there were panel discussions so it's like everywhere you go you need to really be you know, on your game and know about the technical details. For instance, uh, there was a Glasgow dialogue on uh, loss and damage finance. So we were, of course, hoping that that dialogue would lead us in the right direction towards establishing, you know, that facility for uh, loss and damage from climate impacts. But no, we had a lot of discussions about the landscape you know what is the situation requiring financial support for losses and damages from climate impacts and in the end you know you keep hearing developing countries pushing really hard making the case civil society um supporting them but it's very sad because number one it's going to be a three-year process before leading to any meaningful political outcome so three years three years of talk shops you know about the urgency the necessity the vulnerability blah 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 that's crazy second it's not even on the official agenda of the cop no so yeah. In Bonn, we were shouting, put loss and damage on the agenda because it was happening, these discussions were happening on the sidelines of official negotiations. So it doesn't have any status at all. But at least, you know, we're kind of happy that uh, when the um, outgoing UNFCCC Executive Secretary Patricia Espinosa left, she gave a parting gift, no? <laughs> she what said and communicated that loss and damage you know would now be on the agenda of cop 27 oh, as nice. one as one of the matters around climate finance so it's still not that high on the agenda but at least there is already that opening that it is one of the important matters on the climate finance agenda no but she did right because had she put it in the in the SBI, which is the, the body for implementation, or on the 
on the body of technical research so that we don't use so many acronyms with people here <laughs> had she put it there it would have you know just as a program as a standing issue to keep yeah. them being discussed with no capacities for talking about finance so if she put it in the agenda along to finance it means that the resolution needs to go into that direction so there will be some operative uh, functions related to that so that that's good. Good for Patricia. Yeah, it's a good parting, uh, parting gift. <laughs> and then uh, also on the loss and damage front, one of the things that we didn't think was going to be so controversial was this Santiago network on loss and damage. So this was supposed to be uh, established already and operationalized by COP27. So in Bonn, they were trying to agree on the terms of reference. You know, something as boring as terms of reference turned out to be very political because, you know, rich countries, uh, the Santiago Network is supposed to be a facility you know, that would try to see um, what are the needs of developing countries, of communities facing the impacts of uh, climate change, and what is the uh, resources, capacity, and finance available to support them. So it was supposed to be uh, another body. It's a network, no? But then what's funny is it's the rich countries who are so keen. <laughs> Hello, Mati. Mati, <laughs> thank you for watching. Hi, Mati. <laughs> I miss you as well. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry I'm being geeky, huh? No, but the point is rich countries appear to be the ones very insistent on operationalizing the santiago network right away but now it's the developing countries who are saying nope we have to do it the right way now you don't just say like this and it's it's gonna be there because rich countries just want the santiago network to be a matchmaking facility you know like a website this are the needs <laughs> this there is some resources here let's match them and Yep, check. That's already the Santiago network. But developing countries are saying, nah, -uh, that doesn't work that way. You know, we need it to be a meaningful network that would actually deliver on the support for our community. So it became really messy that towards the end they said, okay, let's just talk about this again at COP27. Oh my God. That, that, <laughs> go back again. Maybe I didn't hear it right. What is hmm. actually the Santiago network? What is it? So the Santiago Network is supposed to be the implementing arm of the Warsaw International Mechanism on Loss and Damage. So through it, supposedly, action and support would be delivered. But tricky, tricky rich countries, they said, number one, it doesn't have to be, you know, under the governance of the parties of the UN. You know, even the Red Cross can do that. So they don't the want it to be... What? Yeah, that's what they're pushing for. So now they're trying to conflate humanitarian uh, assistance, development assistance, and loss and damage climate finance. So that's no. the real tricky part. Now trying to put together in one big basket humanitarian aid, um, development finance for poverty reduction, and climate finance as a responsibility of rich countries no they said let's just put them all in one pot and you know we can we can make do with that and that is also what's happening in these negotiations on the new climate finance goal so bond was really messy it's giving it has given me such a huge headache because trying to participate and you know they make you feel like you're part of the negotiations because of this modality of breakout room panel uh thematic discussion blah 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 <laughs> but that issue of the climate finance goal um t tell us more about it i also attended one session and we've been following that from the first dialogue that was um uh virtual well some people attended that that one please tell us more because that is so key yeah so remember all of these talks about the 100 billion dollar uh climate finance uh, pledge from Copenhagen. No? Uh, so long story short, that uh, $100 billion hasn't been met. 
So rich country said, sorry, we regret, we'll try to do better. But yeah, now... But just, to clarify, just to clarify, it's $100 okay. million dollars yearly. Yearly. From yearly. 2020. Yeah? By 2020. And that hasn't been met. The most that we have gotten is like 80%, and that was just one year. And the rest has been between 60 and 70. And most of it through loans. Yep. 70% through debt. Mm -hmm. So now parties are talking about a new collective uh, finance goal. Hopefully by 2025, they would have agreed on this new finance goal already. So again, it's a three-year process. And the... The methodology is through technical expert dialogues, you know, TED dialogues. Uh, so in Bonn, we had the second technical expert dialogue where you had panel after panel, breakout session after breakout session. And then in the end, you hear the same bottom lines, no? Rich countries are saying, uh, we're also experiencing climate impacts. We will try to do our best. Developing countries are saying, no, we need more money. We need uh, easy access to finance. So, yep, that was the end of the second technical expert dialogue. But I attended the, the second one, and there was this panel. There were many panelists, but one of them was super interesting from the IPCC report. And he was saying, first of all, that the IPCC scenarios, you know, he was do, giving the briefing, like, what are we needing to consider for, to, to this new climate finance uh, goal? And he was saying, first of all, the IPCC scenarios do not consider uh, any economic shocks in the, towards the future. So the scenarios are really bad and they didn't include any economic shocks, which are bound to happen, you know, because that is the cyclical nature of the capitalist system. The second he said, we're also not considering any pandemic, any economic crisis whatsoever towards the future. And it's like, what? I mean, in the middle of a pandemic. And thirdly, which was the most insane thing for me, he said, and the IPCC report is not considering the existence of the financial sector towards the future. So, and that is really the most concerning thing because it is the financial sector, the one that is pouring trillions into the fossil fuels uh, industries. So this is really dire. And he was, he was trying to make the case that we really need to make a macroeconomic shift that is really, you know, grounded into earth, into what happens in the daily life of our economic system. And he didn't say it like that. I want to say it he was talking really about addressing the global financial and economic architecture, right? It's not about just pouring money to, to loss and damage in terms of ODA. It's about really shifting the, the, the root causes. So I, I'd say we should have a session just on this. Maybe we should invite uh, some colleagues of ours who have uh, new ideas. I'm looking at you, Mati. Uh, we, we will have a conversation on that. You know, to step out of the conversation under the UNFCCC on the new climate finance goal and really talk about what is the macroeconomic shift that we need to have. Of course, thinking about and then how are we going to tackle real money that needs to go for real solutions rather than shifting official development assistance to poor countries because those come with a colonial lens on the one hand and on the other we've seen how climate finance is coming through that uh, so far so this is a very important uh, conversation and i see that we're 30 minutes i know <laughs> we want to give like 15 minutes for updates you know apparently it's not enough yeah. <laughs> we're we only have about having hlpf but you know i think I, i'm supposed to meet amelia you know and that that we're yeah. supposed to be in hlpf yeah no right? i don't have a us visa yet <laughs> yeah so everyone i, I was supposed to uh, leave mm. uh, you know went to a high-level political forum on the 2030 agenda, which is happening in New York in July, you know, I've already set myself and then, yes, I'm going to meet my despised girls or at least Amelia and then have the, you know, everything that we're thinking and then 
what happened is that I got COVID <laughs> and then yeah this kind of ruined everything but I just want to have like um, a little bit discussion on that uh, on the high level political forum I mean like what what I heard you know like like what you said that that we heard the same thing over and over again and I think that is also true in HLPF right we heard about net zero we heard about nature-based solution we have like this ecosystem approach solution all of those that is coming in and then really there's no sense of urgency at all in relation with tackling the issue and the crisis that we are having right now right so what I'm actually really you know like you know, a lot of a lot of a lot of the people in in and then also bodies, especially the UN, also already said that we will not achieve SDG at all in 2030. And I think that we really need to be really, uh, you know, honest about it. Honest, be honest about it. Just say it. You know, it's not going to happen. You know, UNESCO said that with the progress that we have now in Asia and the Pacific region, we can only achieve um, SDG by 2065, right? And then they said, it's it's it, even that, you know, that measurement that they have like from the research and everything is actually based from the only 47, you know, percent of indicators, right? Of wow. all the indicators that we have, yeah. right? That right. sounded so odd. Imagine, yeah. right? like it, it means the if if we are counting the 53 percent that is missing actually it can go to the 22nd century maybe we're going to have right so people just just be honest that we are not going to have this and i think that we need to use sdg you know processes you know not to only not to only what you call it tracking and then uh monitoring the progress but also to see what is actually the problem and then tackle that right and then that's why there's no sense of ur urgency on the debt crisis no sense of urgency <laughs> in tackling issue of militarism issue of you know peace you know there's nothing like that at all no, so yeah that. I mean, tell me tell me tell me tell me what's going on <laughs> No, I'm so grateful that you say it because again, and I'm gonna say it, uh, we need people in the global north to be just very straightforward on board. If they're just looking after their backs, then you're doing a disservice, even for the community, if you're trying to bring their voices into. So it's really disappointing because even civil society was reluctant to say, oh, we're not gonna meet the SDGs. And that is really, if they're not going to say it, then what's the point of them being there, right? So it's really disappointing. Just for to remind people, HLPF is the high-level political forum that is the space in the UN that monitors the advancement of the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. And so this it meets yearly, and uh, it's supposed to be the space where we monitor uh, the follow-up and implementation of the SDGs. So this is the place where we need to say we're not meeting the SDGs. And people are so terrified of not saying that, that it's like, you know, like a place of all of us being blinded to the reality. But to me, it's like, this is what needs to be said because then we need to push harder. It's also an evaluation for us. So it just, I'm I'm so fed up of of these northern people. Is no, we really uh, I just, just so fed up. They they just want to keep their appearances and their you know their political relations. But even saying a basic thing, as Rina was saying, that even the secretary general is saying, it's not like okay, we're gonna say the most revolutionary thing. I'm gonna become you know a communist by saying this. It's like even the secretary general is saying it. So it's just oh, I'm so disappointed. I think it's time that civil society stops acting and feeling like it's a diplomat you know we should reclaim our role as civil society you know as part of social movements wanting yeah. to, to have real changes and not just you know uh, a two-minute shot at addressing member states in this un meetings I have a lot of gossips, but not for the for the audience to hear oh, because, after this. because I have names. <laughs> but send me an email if you want to know the names. Uh, <laughs> no, but you know, I, I was also thinking that we we missed uh, the G the 
the G7 rally and Teter and I were there. And I think we have a video. I hope we have a video. So tell Teter to tell us all about it. So in Munich, uh, there was the meeting of the G7, you know, the biggest economies in the world. So they met at this super exclusive castle, which was so far away. <laughs> there was no civil society involved in that meeting. So what we did was uh, we joined the people's protest, you know, the anti-G7 uh, mobilization in Munich, where Emilia was the rock star wearing a pink tutu <laughs> and telling everyone <laughs> that the global north has to wake up and organize and mobilize. And Adriana said we do have the video. Maybe we can oh, yeah. show it, no? Yeah. Shut it down. down! If we don't get it, shut it down! It down. Thank you, everybody. I'm Ooh. Emilia Reyes. This is my colleague, my sister, Teta, from the Philippines. I'm coming from Mexico. And we want to tell you that we're very happy to be here in Munich with all of you in solidarity, protesting against the G7. But we also have very bad news for you. We know that after the IPCC report panel was released, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change was released some months ago, we were told that we only have three years to change the system. It's not eight years, it's not until 2050, it's only three years. And a month ago, we had a release of scientific papers saying that all of them combined, even if we stop climate change today, the environmental degradation is so bad that we may be facing the human extinction in 2040. So it's not about 100 years, it's not about the future, it is now, and we want to tell you from the Global South that we are asking for your help. The Global South cannot keep putting the bodies, cannot keep on sending our people into the jails. It is your responsibility. The Global South alone cannot change the system. You need to mobilize. This is the first day of a three years mobilizations for you to hold your governments accountable. You are citizens and we hope that you become stronger in alliances with your social movements, with the feminist movement, with indigenous peoples to make a system change. So this doesn't end now. Hopefully this is the first day of three years strategy to really change the system. And we want a system that is feminist, with an economy that upholds human rights, and we most of all also want to degrow the rich. And that starts also at home with your consumption and production patterns. We cannot keep on seeing the environmental destruction in our territories because your lifestyles keep on demanding the environmental degradation in our water, in our lands, and especially the lives of our indigenous peoples. So we are asking you to mobilize, to strategize, to get yourselves together, and to think about collective action. And I have my colleague Tether here, who will inspire us for that collective action. Oh my God! Where are you? Oh my God! <laughs> it's very strong. Great. How many were there in the action? Was it like an action? What is that? Why, why you have stage? Tell me, tell me, tell me. That was the rally. <laughs> that was the rally. Okay. Uh, we marched. There is an estimate of 6,000 people marching in the rally. So we started in that point. We went to march around the city and when we came back. And it was hilarious that when we were marching because Gina from Colombia in the, you know, from the Women and Gender Constituency, she was there. We had colleagues, German colleagues and people who traveled there. And uh, Gina was carrying this huge loudspeaker and we were singing and dancing and the German people marching, they were like, why are you so loud? Get out of here. We're gonna call the police on you. And we were like, we're protesting in the street. <laughs> We're singing and chanting, you know, what do we want? Crime and justice. And they were so upset. And they were like, no, this is a quiet protest. We want to hear the music. And there were some bicycles that was that were playing, you know, elevator music uh, with, you know, the 
a, a sound equipment. So it was so weird because we were like, no, we're marching. And she was like, no, get out of here. We're going to call the police on you. And we were like, that, that is the insane level of people, you know, who say, oh, I'm going in a protest against the V7. And then once you start, you know, real chanting and mobilizing and bringing people on board, they were like, get out of here. Oh like, my God. Really You're too noisy. <laughs> oh, my God. oh my God. That's so they want to hear music. They want a festival, right? <laughs> they just want to the festive, you know, rather than just real mobilization. That's that's crazy. They made her music. It wasn't even you know, protest music. It was insane. Uh, I don't know if we have a that that singing. Because then Tete went up and sang to to the masses, and she made everybody sing. So that was that was really nice. I hope we have it. So it was really and we were the only ones who kept to the five minute rule. Now yes. supposedly everyone going up the stage would uh, have only five minutes, but we were the only ones who. Uh, kept to that rule everyone had very long speeches but then the organizer said you know what everyone will remember what you did because it was so different no it was uh, something that was new for for the global north to see you know two global south women singing and you know chanting that was yes. crazy. <laughs> that that came with her Arisa Franklin voice. Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> I wish I, I can time saying. travel and put myself there, you know, <laughs> with yes, the two of you. We need to Photoshop you. But you know, we have 20 minutes and we need to use 10 minutes yeah. because we need that. We have another uh, great event that happened during this time, which is the launch of a new The Spice Girls video, The Rise of Sirius. And in this time, episode two talks about uh, the macroeconomic dimension of, of care, of unpaid domestic and care work. So we do want to, to share it with all of you. The video is 10 minutes. So um, I think uh, we should just watch it and then come back and react. It's a plane! It's a drone! No! It's the empowered almighty women! Super women! Wow! She's my mom! Something wrong. That's it. We are done. We can't no longer bear the burden of sustaining life. 
The impacts of climate change escalate our unpaid domestic and care workload. Women of the least developed countries and the small islands bear the brunt of all of the crisis combined. No woman in the world can bear this situation any longer. Greedy sector, we have a problem. Huh? The superwomen are complaining about their obligations. Hmm? They realize now that the notion of empowerment is just an excuse to exploit them even more. Let's get rid of them! No! Don't be a fool! Hmm. Nobody will do what they do! Your multinational corporation should help them. Hmm. Don't worry, girls! My friend and I will save you! A nice surprise is on your way! <laughs> Now, girls, say hello, money. You will also take home the exclusive Chef Rordon Gamsi's cookbook. <laughs> <laughs> and to enhance your displays of affection, what about these workshops? <laughs> I got this. Let's pay men to help a tiny bit with parenting. So you can finally get rid of those rags and become fine ladies. The Empowerment Suit! These are not solutions! What you call a rag is a symbol from Pacific activists to the world. We're saying with pride that it's us, you, women and gender diverse people, who sustain and defend the commons. We're not fictional characters. Women are the real Wonder Women. The capes are symbols of work for justice, rebalancing of ecology, of autonomy, and of freedom. What? I've read all about the wealth of nations! I am a follower of Adam Smith, hashtag father of economics! Ouch, no! Oh. How is the division of labor thingy going? Oh, wonderfully! I have come to the conclusion that in the overall economy, value is the result of labor. Your pins, for instance. Are you going to include my word and that of women? Of course not! My dissertation is centered on those who produce the pins. That is to say, productive men. <laughs> oh, what about us? Oh, sweetie pie, you women do not even work. <laughs> so you do not generate any value. What do you mean I don't work? I buy groceries. I cook your dinner, lunch, breakfast, and even your snacks. So you can dedicate all of your time to play around with your invisible hand. My mommy pampers me. Oh, get out of here, mom. You're just wasting my time. We intelligent, autonomous, and grown-up men need to continue working for economic growth. Grown-ups? Autonomous? <laughs> You cannot even boil an egg. Eh? <laughs> Preposterous! <laughs> yes, Adam Smith was a great man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh. <laughs> eh? Adam Smith? He only considered that productive work was only this tiny segment representing work, mainly done by men. And it is so fragile, it is held only by the teeth of a pin. Because the real support comes from the unpaid work done by women. The work and its multiple crises are sustained by the extraction of women's labor and time. Especially of those women facing multiple discriminations. This is why, super government, you have to recognize all of the work done by us. What do you think you are? Men with rights? Let's get rid of them! 
Women do this for love. They were born to take care of us. Empowerment. Those are fairy tales. Cleaning the house and looking after of all the family members is not love. It is work. So, my mommy doesn't love me. Stop exploiting your mom. It is not all women. These are ideas of a few haters, right? Haters. A few. Will women succeed in convincing super government of the importance of redistributing work and changing their current situation? All the women in the world join us in the global fight. Can domestic labor rise? Can systems in the rise? Super government, you are the warrior of the care policies. It is your duty to ensure women's rights. There is no women's empowerment without women's human rights. Care should not be confined to the family realm. The value of care is not to be extracted for the profit of the private sector. Yeah, yeah, we want social protection laws and universal care systems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Representation and recognition yeah, of domestic yeah, and care workers. Yeah, yeah, Just transition of the labor force with a gender perspective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Investing access to quality care services for all. Progressive taxation is the way to go. Financial institutions should be accountable for redistribution. Care is in crisis because of all of the other crises. Domestic and care work sustain life and must be recognized as work. It must be fairly distributed in society. Collective action and mobilizing are the real superpowers. And while we're on it, hooray for the mighty, mighty feminists.
Yay! <laughs> that was great. Congratulations. I love it. It's so nice. And there are so many things uh, we need to say about this video. But as, um, as a gift from the campaign of campaigns to our audience today, we also have two other small snippets of videos that we're producing to share with people. So let's first see um, the, the first gift, Adriana. Ooh. All the women in the world, join us in the global fight. Can domestic labor rights, care systems in the rights, yeah, 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 God, I want that. That we need to learn, Amelia. We need to learn how to sing like that. Yeah, <laughs> I know it's so bluesy, you know. Hey, yeah. hey, 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 hey. Oh my gosh, but that gives us an idea. We can the, the lyrics will evolve now for the next videos, yeah, depending exactly. on the topic, depending on the yes. theme. This was Shirley Tagi, everyone. She's an activist from the Pacific Islands and she just inspires us all wherever she goes. And she was she has a gift, evidently, and she gave it all for this video. And we're super grateful. And just wanted to say, I hope we can stay a couple of minutes after the 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 sharp ending. Uh, she the, the, the video is trying to, to highlight not only the economic burden of women around the world, but really that at the, in the sum of all of the crisis, uh, what is the important contribution of women from the small islands and developing states and the least developed countries, because they're getting all of the burden of all of the crisis combined. And that, that adds to our decolonial analysis, right? So the, the video is including the participation of many of our activist colleagues from, from the Pacific Islands, but also activist women in real grassroots communities doing their, their regular activities in fishery, fishing, um, agriculture, you know, fixing rural uh, um, buildings, you know, the, the cottages. And so they're so amazing. And we really wanted to pay homage to them in this video. And they all came and they were sending us their lines through their cell phones, you know, barely having access to networks. And the Diva team also helped us gather uh, a lot of the, the participation of all of these women. And we had in the launch um, Nalini Singh, who's also an amazing leader uh, from the Pacific, as well as Noeline Navilobu. So it was a very powerful launch. We did it in the during HLPF, just a, a pre-launch, and we're thinking also on organizing a launch for the Pacific uh, time uh, in in an up, in maybe in in a month. But we really wanted to start sharing this video. It's gonna be the link in YouTube. We're gonna be sharing it around. It's for free for you to download, to use, to share and to spark the conversation of these macroeconomic dimensions. As, as the, the Spice Girls were saying, care is not micro, it's macro. So it requires macro solutions. <laughs> Amazing. We're at a loss for words. No, it's so powerful. And I think it's really good that um, we are also able to bring in the Pacific voices in many of these spaces, no? That's true. And then, and then, so 
yeah, let's wait until they're launching together with the, our Pacific sisters in the next uh, month, one month time. And then for us, when is our next Despise Girls? In 15 days, please. I cannot bear any longer that we're just I know. No, let's let, let's let's do a regular uh fortnight uh wait and I'll see you in, in 15 days in two weeks. All right, thank everyone. you everybody. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so